Well, Joe, I see Cancel Lewis trending on Twitter right now, so I don't... <laughs> I... Happy to Comic Book Day, geeks, and welcome to issue 23 of the Script Heroes podcast. The show where we bring you comic news, book reviews, and industry blues. My name is Joseph Jasonowski, and I'm the writer of Gender Hero, Cunning Carly, and the Cryptoverse. And I'm Katie Markham, scripter of the Rusty Robot Country Club and ghostwriter extraordinaire. Today we have some awesome polls for you. We are looking at the triumphant return of Batman Offworld number four, the displaced number three, Lotus Land number six, and also the long way to return, Moon Man number two. That's right, and we have maybe my most highly anticipated back issue review yet, as we read Katie for the first time ever, one of my favorite mm-hmm. comics. The Last Ronin by Tom Waltz, Kevin Eastman, the Escorza Brothers, and Ben Bishop. Pretty, pretty thrilling. I've been hearing about this book yeah. for however long <laughs> it's been coming out. And uh, I, I do appreciate that my, my jump into Turtles is the Mirage Turtles where it started, and then one of the like highest yeah. regarded Turtles books of all time. Uh, yeah, the, the the Mirage book needs it like is the right intro to this because this is the most Mirage esque of my, because like mm-hmm. this is based on an old pitch. So right, it, it right. works. It works. Uh, but this week in the creator corner, we will be joined by Lewis Southard, a villain seeking hero, Midnight Western Theater, and comics are dying the comic. And if you enjoy that interview or any other part of this podcast. Uh, consider following it for more, and you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, all at the handle Script Heroes Pod. And you can find my personal socials at JJAZ1111 on all the same sites. And I'm on all socials at Katie Markham Pro. Now, on to the news. Okay, so to start off the news this week, we finally have the follow up on what that coming soon 2099 bit of tease Ooh. from uh i think it was from um uh it was from the end of the miguel o'hara spider-man 2099 yes. wasn't mistake all right is where this do we teased. remember what we guessed i think i think we guessed punisher was one of uh, of i think my guesses um oh gosh it was so long ago i think did you did you guess ghost rider or something I, like I that? think i probably go guessed ghost rider because yeah. um or no, I think I, I think I was trying to avoid ones who had already had a twenty ninety nine. Okay, okay, okay. Maybe that's what, maybe we reverse guessed and said things yeah. that we didn't think were happening. Yeah, In I, don't, any case. I don't really fully remember the guesses. I don't think we got any guesses right, but it's going to be I think built around an event that they're calling Annihilation twenty ninety nine, which is going to be written by Steve Orlando. Ooh. Um, and then artists kind of across. The because there's going to be solo books and the Annihilation book, um, and the artists across these are Nick Bradshaw, Ibrahim Robertson, uh, Jose Luis, Pete Woods, Ario Andita, and Dale Eaglesham. Um, and basically, there's going to be the Annihilation book. There's going to be Nova 2099, Star Lord 2099, Red Hulk 2099. Silver Surfer 2099, and then I think the only one that's going to be a return from a previous uh, 2099 book is Dracula 2099. Yeah, we definitely didn't get a single one of those. No, no, <laughs> no. Nova, I feel like, is, was maybe guessable. Like, Nova makes a lot of sense, mm-hmm. and I, I it just didn't think... The rest, I'm shocked. Like, Red Hulk 2099 is weird. That's real weird. I mean, are they, do we know, are they bringing in the other 2099s? Like the, the previous series characters? Um, the only thing there's actual solicits for is Annihilation 2099. I think. Okay. Art by Ibrahim, art by Jose, art by Pete Woods. Like, I, I would think. assume that Spider-Man is going to be there. Since it was, like, spinning out of his book, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I guess the question is, are, like, the decades-old characters from the 2090, uh, 2099 universe going yeah. to be coming in? I, here's what I'll say. Event? In, as I scroll through the blurbs for the Annihilation event, there are, there is no, the blurbs are mostly small, but they are, none of the covers have Spider-Man on, the, on them. And, uh. None that of the blurbs mentioned Spider Man. Like, yeah. you would think. 
the biggest do... 2099 character. I see. Um. Oh, okay. So the Star Lord 2099 is a Wakandan uh, woman. I don't want to say that it's Shuri because I'm assuming it's not Shuri if it's 2099, but it looks mm-hmm. like Shuri. Because, and well, they describe I know it as that Star Lord has goddess. passed mantle before. Like Kitty yeah. Pride was Star Lord for a while. Yeah, yeah, but I'm guessing this is like a descendant of Sherry would be my my guess. That's rad. Um, I uh, know basically nothing about the Guardians or yeah. the Black Panther mythos. Uh, okay, uh, so so really looking at these closely, just to, to kind of amend what I said, the Annihilation event is going to be, I think, the the title of the books, and then each is a one shot essentially. Oh. It looks like of these different characters, so like they have a subtitle. The first one is Nova, the second one mm-hmm. being Star-Lord, the third one being Red Hulk, the fourth one being Silver Surfer, and the fifth gotcha. one being Dracula. So, Still wild a little bit of a Spider-Man there. anywhere in there. No, no. I mean, I don't know what happened to him in, in the, 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 <laughs> the other book because I didn't read it, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Honestly, this being like an event one-shot thing probably makes it most accessible for us to cover it on the pod if we, you know, consider it because... <laughs> It's only one book a month compared to, you know, that is, if that they were is running fair. a whole universe and event. Not saying that we will, but saying it the option It also makes there. it feel much more... Like, we were talking before about how we didn't think it made a whole lot of sense for them to be doing a whole new universe after just restarting the Ultimates universe as well. Yeah. Uh, so this... That does make a lot of sense that it's a singular event. Yeah. Speaking of new universes that don't make a whole lot of sense... Um, we have a new bit of DC news. We talk um, about DC have you seen this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I figured you've probably seen this one. Yeah, give us um, the rundown for the folks at home. So, there has been, I think, rumors for at least a year now, maybe close to two years at this point, that Scott Snyder was going to do some sort of ultimate line for DC Comics. Um, this bit of news basically says, yes, that is true. It's going to be called either Absolute or Absolute Comics. Apparently not clear whether or not there will be a comic slapped on the end yet. Um, And then the article gets a very circular saying a lot of words to say nothing, which is like, okay, it's not going to be an entirely like separate continuity of its own. Scott Snyder's not going to be entirely hands on. Like it's not going to be all him. Mm. And it's going to be not a reboot or relaunch. It will remain intact continuity. Um, DC, and it's kind of part of DC All In, which is a broader initiative Snyder and other creators have been working on. Um, So they said that this seems to be somewhat similar to DC Rebirth, which is interesting to say for something that's seen as a separate... Yeah, because I thought that Universe. it wasn't replacing any mainline titles, and that it was instead it's not. kind of That's the weird thing, but it also, like, they're saying that it's not its own, like, it, it feels like just another Black Label L squirrel, right? you know, like, million That's what gets me, different is that line from DC. I like that Black Label kind of made its thing being, like, oh, like, kind of adult-themed comics. Like, I understood that being its own thing. Yeah, Elseworlds yeah. makes sense as its own thing, where it's like, these are completely out of continuity. These are just like, uh, you know, fun little things. Like, what if... Basically, what if? Uh, I don't understand what the point of Absolute is going to be. And I am particularly uh, a little torqued to find that it's called Absolute knowing that our summer event is absolute power, and I'm like, no way that this is gonna just, like... Like, I don't want there to be a canon reason that this publishing offshoot exists. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, it I feels like it's gonna that. be something where Amanda Waller, like, fucks with the multiverse in some way, and now it's like, yeah, these are other stories from across the multiverse. It's like, we already have space for that. Shoot. Just coming at it, here's my weird conspiracy theory. My weird conspiracy theory is that they're going to somehow, like, split the Earth into, like, a branch timeline. So, like, Absolute will pick up where we are, but go its own way. That's, I've heard that's that it's also going to be focused on the Trinity. 
the the events so, focus on the Trinity, not to be compared with the. Uh, I've I've heard some rumblings that, uh, and I don't know how factual this is, just from passively absorbing information throughout the week. Yeah. That uh, I think it was speculation that because the event is focused on the Trinity, uh, that then the books that are going to come out of it are going to be kind of Trinity based, and since. Uh, Mark Wade and uh, Dan Mora are leaving uh, World's Finest Batman and Superman. They're like, okay, maybe he's going to be going to, to Superman. And that with uh, Bruno Redondo and Tom Taylor leaving Nightwing, it's like, okay, maybe they're going to go to Batman. Though I would hope that Scott Snyder would have something to write in this universe if it's like his thing. Um, yeah. So I, here's I don't the, know. Here's the one thing we know about what this line is supposed to be, which. I don't know how you'll feel. It leaves a slight sour taste in my mouth to get a whole line for this. But the idea is that it's going to be a line entirely dedicated to A-list creators. Which, giving them their own line that isn't even like a separate universe. I don't know. It feels, a little, it feels like DC is essentially just going to brand certain titles. This is going to be good because these are better creators than everybody else. Like, that's the vibe I get from reading this, which is a little weird to me. I mean, on the one hand, I feel like the immediate thought I have is like, oh, that's, I guess, a nice opportunity for up-and-coming creators to work on mainline DC. But then the immediate follow-up is, oh, wait, they aren't going to be doing as much mainline DC if they're, like, the talent that they believe in already is working on these other titles. Yeah, Yeah, I... Look. It also feels like a shitty consolation prize if it's like, you get to write, you know, like, here's this up-and-comer, we'll hand you, you know, I'm thinking like a B-list, like, we'll hand you Green Arrow, because we're taking the people who are on Green Arrow, and now they get to do, you know, like, Batman and stuff in the main continuity. And then yeah. It's like, but then also, you know, Mark Wade's writing, you know, absolute Green Arrow, so we're <laughs> going to really market that one, and, and, and we're going to tell people that's the better Green Arrow, but you're also doing Green Arrow, so good for you, buddy. So, like, good for you. No, it's so weird... I feel like the move should have been a like um like a full line for like Marvel does their Stormbreakers covers where it's like new mm. up and coming artists and they do like cool cover art uh but if they did like a line that's like hey this is for new up and coming uh creators and maybe it's like limited series or one shots or something and it's like just yeah. to kind of get people's feet in the door then I'd be like this is super rad I love this for you DC but it's yeah. just confusing. And here's the thing. I am, above all else, a DC girly. <laughs> they frustrate me so much with how weird they are on the, like, business side of things. They're always making these baffling decisions that make little to no sense. And it just leaves me wondering why. <laughs> why? They are announcing something. And, like, the, just go through the podcast. It's proof of this. They're announcing something bonkers nearly monthly. Constantly. Like, it's just constantly. This new thing that DC's doing that could either be awesome or awful. And it's just constant. And, like, the thing is, I am all for innovation and trying new things. Oh, yeah. Like, 100%. But it's... I am so fatigued. <laughs> From now, like, <laughs> ten years of being a DC girly and just trying to keep up and understand. And, like, I feel like Rebirth was such a, a beautiful moment where it's like, ah. It was. We get, we get like, Eight years three ago years. Now. Yeah. Of, of <laughs> just normal content. <laughs> and books <sighs> that just went. Like, I can't yeah. really think of many books that got canceled early in Rebirth. Like, it was books that were going... It was and you going. Know, I'm I'm trying to think. Were there like because Titans the I think was later, ended right? at like there were no big they, they weren't really doing big events right either. I, I can't remember so. huge events at that time, exactly. which was nice. And then like I think it was a little bit after they were like dropping the rebirth monikers and stuff that it was like here comes Doomsday Clock. Here's Final. I think Final Crisis or not Final uh, fuck, Heroes in Crisis was the first one, right? Yes, I think it went. And that Heroes was in Crisis. In... Here's Doomsday Clock. That 2019. was in 2019. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had those like three that. years, and then it was Heroes in Crisis, which we we're not going to get into. I, I I promise you, we will never talk about Heroes in Crisis on this podcast. <laughs> Roy Unless it's better. like a list of worst events. <laughs> oh my gosh, I 
I have thoughts. <laughs> it was my first event, like, when I was actually reading comics, which is so sad. Like, I had oh, read no. events from the past, but it was, like, my first one that I got to read as it was coming out, and it was, oh. Not, not good. No. No. In any case, if we haven't been negative enough, there's some cool stuff maybe to come out of this. I just want to see yeah. how they handle it. And we'll talk about our polls where hopefully we will be a little bit more positive. So um, let's head over to the Polis Rec. Let's do it. All right, gang, we have some rad polls for you this week. We have Batman Offworld number four. We've got Lotus Land number six, the conclusion the of the series. Way. We've got Moon Man, number two. That one I have physically. And we've got The Displaced, number Don't three. have that one physically either. But of course, that's <laughs> not all we picked up this week. Jaybird, what'd you get? Yes. Okay, I think it's a, it's a fairly packed week. Maybe it's Same. not. Same. We'll My week threes are Co- chonky. Cobra Commander, number four. Green Lantern War Journal, Number eight. I actually have most of these. Am I going to try to do this? Green Lantern War Journal, number eight. thing is, I have like my last two weeks here, so that's not super useful. <laughs> He's confused um, himself. Nightwing, 113. There it is. Um, uh, do I have my Secret History book here? No. Did I forget to pick up a Secret History of the Foot Clan? I might have. In which case, <gasps> I need to get that. Secret History of the Foot Clan, number two. And Titans, number ten. As I just... Did an awful attempt to, to, to do that. But Katie, what did you pick up? Yeah, uh, so again, my, my pulls are split between stores. So Nightwing and Titans should be for me at uh, my my other store. Uh, but I also got Helen of Windhorn, number two. Uh, Zoe Thurgood's Hack Slash Back to School, number four. I think that's the end of that mini. Uh, Jill and the Killers, number yeah. four. And then there were some new number ones this week that I was psyched about. Uh, Blown Away number one love me a romance story number one <laughs> and dudley datson and the forever machine by scott snyder number one but Ooh, of fancy. our combined pulls what order would you like to discuss them in um do we start with off world is that the 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 play i feel like that's um, the play. then maybe we do uh we gotta we gotta Get the we we got to keep publishers together. Actually, none For of these some are the same publisher, are they? Uh, yeah, the Displaced and Lotus Land are both boom. Okay, so we'll do. Well, then I think we go, um, Moon Man, followed by the Displaced, and I think you end with the with the end of a series. Let's end with you the know end, that makes yeah. sense to me. Which yeah, means yeah. that we are so. starting with the middle uh, in Batman Offworld. <laughs> that we are. So, let's head off world. Fantastic transition. Go! Nailed it. Batman Offworld number four. The Dark Knight sci fi epic continues. Finally. In a faraway, war torn <laughs> galaxy, Batman sets his sights on the villainous Black Sun Mining Company. But standing in his way is the most ruthless bounty hunter in the universe, a man known only as the Thanagarian. Uh, The writer here is Jason Aaron of Thor, Avengers, and Wolverine. The penciler is Doug Mankey of Detective Comics, Green Lantern, and Superman. The inker is uh, Jamie Mendoza. The colorist is David Barron. And the letterer is Troy Pateri. Jay, it's been so terribly long since we read Batman Offworld. Yeah, I missed it, honestly, coming back to it. I missed it so much. It's such a fun time. The... I love the Thanagarian's design and just right. the whole vibe around. I really like the other, like the the overarching wom- woman, you know, who's like the the one pulling the strings and who hires him. I can't think of her name. Uh, I don't know if we know her name. We know Brother Whisper or Lord Whisper. I don't know that we got her name in this one, which is rough after yeah, months yeah. of not having. Um, yeah. You talk. I'll find yeah. her name. I don't think it's in here. She mentions her, so you know, Lord Lady Whisper's Raph. name, but I don't think her name's in there. Lady Wrath. Okay, yeah, I like Lady Wrath a lot too. Like, I think she's this good presence. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I really the the dialogue is always a little bit hammy with Jason Aaron, but I don't know, it works really it works. well, especially in this issue. I feel like I, yeah, I got so behind it in this issue. I was feeling everything I think that I was meant to be feeling. I was getting really excited for the fights and the battles and the way it was building. This is such a cool like 
I'm the motherfucking Batman book. Right. And it does get you excited about it. Um, the the few jokes that there are, I find legitimately funny most of the right? time because they feel very like genuine. Um, like the your your punch bot, find me somebody to punch. Like Right? Oh, yes. I loved when uh, Lady Wrath was talking to the dude Batman beat last issue. And she's like, he beat you alone. He's like, no, he had a dog and a punch robot whose entire purpose is to get punched in the face. And he's like, they, yeah. were, they were threatening. It's fine. It was, and it then was later, so like, her being like, find me what planet Batman's come from. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I am so enthused about this. Uh, Doug Mankey's art is phenomenal. I'm not like the oh, biggest yeah. fan of this bat suit. The su- I guess the suit, not as much. I wasn't. As and then there the was cowl. this two-page splash. I was and literally I was just like, looking at the same uh, splash. Yeah. I'm like, it's the cowl. I don't like the cowl. <laughs> the cowl has, like, a little bit too much depth to it, where it feels mm-hmm. so thick, which I guess makes sense for the... But it, right, like, in you're in space, sense. you're absorbing alien hits, but still. Uh, the wolf is still there, which is good. Gotta have a dog. Um... And the adventure is so fun. Like, yeah. I feel like they did such a good job of hitting a very, like, a very Batman logic with it, where at first it was that he went here to train so he can fight aliens to protect uh, Gotham, and now it's like they're abducting orphans, and of course he can't just leave because they're abducting orphans. And like you said, they, and like you've said previously, it could be annoying to have a Batman who can just beat everyone. Because when it's a bunch of... When it's, like, Batman beating Superman, it's like, okay, but we know Superman. We know Superman's vibe. With this, they do such a good job of pitting Batman up against, like, original aliens. So it's like, okay, okay, I can... It it doesn't feel like Batman is kicking your favorite... Uh, like, your favorite character's ass uh, when he shouldn't yeah. be able to because he is just a man. Uh, they are borderlining feels... into it here by picking a Thanagarian over, you know, another original thing. I'm sure that there are oh, Hawkman yeah. fans who are very mad right now. All six well, of them. He's getting <laughs> all six Hawkman fans. <laughs> he seems to be uh, in a position he, of getting he, his yes. ass kicked by the Thanagarian. He so. is. That's very yeah. true. That's very true. And like he never beats and Ione, I who uh yeah. is a Tamaranian, and so it's it it all feels like good, safe fun. Where it's like, yeah, I can just enjoy Batman kicking alien yeah. ass <laughs> and getting his ass. Like, uh, it feels like, and it's weird for like a Bat God book that is Batman running through it. Like, mm-hmm. it feels like there's legitimate stakes because there's like certain levels of characters that are just beating him. Yeah. So yeah, and like we've talked about in previous issues of it, but it's been so long. I want to remind because it's so great. We like, physically see Batman training against these. It's not some, yeah. like, oh, well, you've activated my trap card, because actually I know this about you. It's, yeah. oh, yeah, he's out here training to fight aliens, specifically. Yeah. And, and and there's still, what like, when, when he gets in the Thanagarian, like, one of the first things he says is, like, we didn't train for a Thanagarian, so I'm yeah. screwed. Which is, like, such a nice so consistency. Cool. Right? Like, it's not like, ah, oh, you were training specifically for these other aliens, how can you now handle this one that wasn't there? It's like, I can't. I can't, and I'm getting my ass kicked. Good thing Lady Wrath wants him alive. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, such a good fun time. Are you ready to throw a numbered rating on this book? I am. I'm throwing an 8 out of 10 on this one. I just enjoyed this series a ton. It's really great comic book art with comic book writing that sets up the comic book art to Mm -hmm. be really cool in these big impactful moments. Great action. And a fun story. Not much else to say. Yeah, I'm a step below, or a half step below you, I guess. I'm at a 7.5 out of 10. I was, again, the design of the bat suit was really, every time I saw it, I was like, mm, something that just doesn't feel quite right about That's it. Fair. Uh, so That's that fair. So that pulled me down a little bit. And again, it is just a good time. It is. Would you call number four in this series a pull list rack? I didn't reread the first three, and it's been like three months, and I felt perfectly fine. So I'm going to call this a pull list rack. I think I'm going to agree with you. I feel like if it was the previous issue where he was, like, fighting to take control of the war storm, yeah, I don't think we called that it, would be, uh, it would be rougher. But no, we're kind of in the second arc of what feels like a two-arc story. 
Uh, so yeah. it's actually kind of a jumping out point. So go ahead, grab Batman off world number four. Pull us right yeah, from both of us. Do you want to move over to, I think we're doing... Um, Moon Man, we're staying in space. Moon Man, yeah. So let's go be a man on the moon. Moon Man mm-hmm. number two. As Raymond tests the limits of his new abilities, the astronauts return to Janus for more assessment and the world begins to react to the news of a real-life superhero. The writers are Scott Mascuti, Kyle Higgins, uh, who's worked on Power Rangers, Radiant Black, and Nightwing. Uh, the artist is Marco Licati of Ram God and Capissi the Dragon Incident. Uh, the colorist is Igor Monti, and the letter is Hassan Atzman Alao. Katie. I like Moon Man so much. It's just so pretty. Like, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I know that we normally start positive and then get to our negatives. I'm gonna start with the negatives because I, I, they are there. Very much so. There is very little plot movement. There is very little character development. It's just so pretty. (laughs) I love the art on it so much. And like, the thing is, I started this by saying I love Moon Man. Uh, I don't know that it's like a particularly great book, but it just it looks so good and it feels so energized when I'm reading it. I'm so conflicted about it. Uh, like in this in this uh, issue, we get these awesome pages of like this full, amazingly colored uh, like art of. Ramon going on this adventure as he explores his powers is like diving around the city and it, it just, it makes, it feels like something pulled out of a video game and it's so cool and I like it so much. And then I kind of finish and I'm like, okay, let's write down my thoughts. And I'm like, oh, I guess the plot didn't really move. I guess the characters didn't grow much. I guess that there's not a lot going for this book other than these like really cool art sequences. <laughs> Uh, so I need you to to help me figure out where my objectivity can lay. You, that was honestly a really well put like summary of how this book <laughs> is. Like the way that I phrase it is, I think the plot goes in circles in this book. Like it feels mm-hmm. like we just move forward just to go right back to where we were in the last right. issue, just to then move forward at the very end of this issue. It's like, don't love that. Also, the first like. I don't know why all of this book is useless. Like the first yeah. hour of many pages do nothing. And yeah. I'm just sat there. That the art is boring because it's not doing anything. Like it's just showing you characters. And so I'm like, well, it's not really great to look at right now because nothing's happening and nothing's happening in the plot. So what am I, what am I doing here? That being said, when the art gets to do things, it is gorgeous. I'm gonna caveat that with, I do think it's hard to follow at times. Like in the action sequences, I'm not sure I always know exactly what's going on. Um, like he'll be on top of a car and then he'll suddenly be, you know, like punching the front of it. And I'll be like, mm-hmm. how did we kind of get there? Um, and like kind of things like that. Like it, it's very nice to look at because this is cool. Like you said energetic, it's very energetic, but I yeah. don't know that it's always clear to track the moment of mm-hmm. the energy to the next moment. So I didn't really enjoy this overall is where that I think is so I'm fair. <laughs> I don't know that it's a, like, I don't know that as a comic book, it's coming together. Like, mm-hmm. it feels more like, you know, um, some, like, album covers strewn right? together with then moments of just a bunch of characters talking between them. No, no, that that was kind of what I landed on, too, where uh, I, in my brain, I described it as, like, concept art for, like, yeah. really cool moments and then not really being able to bridge between those moments. Uh yeah. And so, like, that's not a good thing. That's, like, demonstrably bad. But also, it's so cool when it's doing it right that it throws me completely for a loop. Because I I really, really like the times that it's doing it right, but it's kind of not the dominant state of the book to be doing it right, yeah. which is a bummer. Um, I mean, like, how many pages here am I going to go through with? Just, right. like characters and like you said in the first issue we see that there's like problems with janice the corporation that uh ramon works for uh and where this accident happened that gave him superpowers and we see him interfere to protect protesters against uh the the corporation 
And then we see him defending the corporation again at the start of this. And then at the end of it, we get kind of more of him taking a stand against them. And it's like, ah, the character is not arcing. No, I feel like this issue just did what the first issue did again. Yes. And so I'm left here like, well, you had a gap, so I guess it's nice. But like, (laughs) you just gave me another issue one. Like this doesn't feel like an issue two. That being said, Uh, it's always tough when there's a lot of competency involved. Like, the art's competent. The actual, like, individual aspects of, like, the dialogue is very competent. And then you land there and you're like, what is an issue? Is it doing anything? Right? And it has me... (laughs) It has me be like, Kyle, you're supposed... This is your job, Mr. Higgins. (laughs) Like, Kid Cudi (laughs) is the the co-writer on this. Um, and, And, like, he's clearly got cool ideas. But it's like, he's not a comic writer. He's a, a music artist. And so Mr. Higgins, you're supposed to be kind of directing the ship here. Yeah. Uh, and it feels like perhaps the uh, the good ideas are being used instead of, like, changed and developed. Like, I can, it's one of those things where I can see with this book the ideas in place, but I don't feel like they yeah. really turn into a great story. It's a fantastic concept. Right? And all of yeah, is amazing. I'm going to throw it to you for the rating first here, because, you know, okay. it's your turn to go first. But It is my turn to go first. It's a tough one. It's a tough one. And I think if, if y'all have been listening to the pod for a while, you know how much I defy giving anything a bad rating. Uh, I gave it a 5.5 and so much of that is because of the sequences of art that are just incredibly unique and fantastically energized and super cool no I think that's fair I'm gonna be a half step below you I give this a 5 out of 10 because again like it's not just bad it's not like you read it and it's like, this is yeah. garbage, the art's garbage, the writing's garbage. Like, that's just not true. And if that's yeah. the way that it comes across, then we've done a bad job of actually illustrating what we're trying to say. Like, it's just not creating a great overall comic book. So yeah. five out of ten is where I've landed. And, and I'm not going to tell you to pull, especially issue two no. of this book. Though it is oh. essentially issue one. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I am with you there. <laughs> so no pull this wreck for the no. Moon Man. But perhaps but there will head be over to the for displaced. the displaced. Let's go see. We shall see. The displaced number three. It turns out literally being forgotten has its advantages when committing crimes. Not all of the displaced are happy with such an ethically questionable life, but finding an alternative path with limited skills in their remaining population will be more difficult than they can imagine. This is coming to us from writer Ed Brisson of the Uncanny X-Men, Old Man Logan, and Batman Incorporated. The artist is Luca Casaluguida of James Bond, Scouts Honor, and Lost Soldiers. The colorist is Dee Knife, and the letter is Hassan Osman Alao. Jay. Again. Oh yeah, he's he's all over it. Uh, like, I feel like it's him and him, Wes Troy Abbott. Troy Pettery and Russ Wooten and Russ Wes Abbott. Wooten. Those four. Yeah, yeah. They're just all over the place. Yeah. Everyone. There are only four Letter, letters like in the book. comic community. There are only um, four letters in comic books. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Jay, how do you feel about the displaced number three? I love this. I love this book so much. Right. I love this issue so much. Like, this book is just so good. It's like, so good. Banger after banger issue. Uh, I I think that they this is there's so often you go with a book and you're like, this is a great concept. They're not using it to its fullest potential. This mm. is using a concept to its fullest potential. Mm-hmm. Like they just keep doing, oh yeah, I guess I guess that would work if 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 you know people forget you when they don't see you anymore. Oh man, I guess yeah, I guess you could do that. Oh man, I guess that would be one of the problems. Like they just keep doing it. Yeah. It's so cool. It feels this is going to be such a weird comparison, but it feels like when you read The Walking Dead and you're constantly I was like, about oh, I guess that would happen like in a zombie apocalypse. Dead. Yeah. Like it's I love that is my favorite thing in comics where it feels like people are using their concept mm-hmm. to its fullest potential. And I so think I love so this. much I think of that the dialogue is, in this issue is so good too. Right. Just, mm. And I think so much of the like concept as background is because it is essentially background. Like yeah. kind of like with The Walking Dead, they're not, at least as far as I've read, they're not like looking for a cure. That's not 
yeah. a thing in The Walking Dead. They're trying to survive in this new world. And they're not, like, looking for Ashwa in the displaced. Yeah. Because it's gone. They're just trying to yeah. adapt and live in this world. And that makes sure that the concept is constantly there and informing everything without it yep. being a concept-heavy book. Like, it is very much about the way, uh, even in the little summary, in the way that the displaced are interacting with each other and how they, as people, are, you know, reacting to this new world uh, that they live in. And it's 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 so yep. well done. It's so great. I, I absolutely love this book. I want to, because something you said there was very interesting, like, they're the same way as in The Walking Dead. Such a weird comparison that we keep making here, but... It's just so funny because like, we've both made it independently. New, yeah, because they're they're in, adapting to this new world. And something that was very interesting is when I, you know, because I've been getting the displaced digitally, um, mm. which, you know, maybe I'll get it physically at some point, I'll get the trade, but I'm getting it digitally on Amazon, Comixology, slash Kindle, whatever. And when I went to buy this issue, I saw it, like, in the tags, it's post-apocalyptic. And I was like, that's weird, but kind of right? Like, not for everyone else, but for the displaced, it kind of is. Yeah. So, I don't know, just such a cool way to turn that concept on its head. And makes sense why I love it, because I absolutely love post-apocalyptic <laughs> books. And it's such a, like you said, turn it on its head, because it's not that they are, it's not that the world... They don't have to, like, scavenge for supplies. They have to scavenge in, like, a completely new way through, like, lying and manipulating. And Yeah, because they don't have identities or money or, you know. Yeah. And it's it's just so... It's so rad. This book is so yeah. good. I don't have a because, whole lot like, else the, to the say about it. Fine. I do want to touch on... They aren't fine. Which is exactly. Fine. Their world ended. Uh, yeah. There is some really cool stuff happening in this specific issue. Like when, um, oh no, oh Everything no, our, our female lead. What is her name? Oh no. One criticism of this book, they could say the names a little bit more they, often. They certainly could. Um, but she and our main dude have a conversation that's like really kind of uh, exciting for like the possibilities of this book. And then there's a whole yeah. lot going on with Harold, who's the, the old I, man who's not Harold's from Oshawa. So good. Everything, every single line that Harold says in this, in this issue is awesome. And I am. It's so, so cool. It's so well done. I, I like this book so much. Are you ready to throw a number rating on it? Yeah. Last thing, um, because I always like calling this out when it happens, God tier issue ender. And a God tier yes. issue ender is one of the mm -hmm. best things a comic book can do. Oh yeah. And uh, yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm ready to slap a rating on this for sure. I love this series. Um, I don't remember what I gave issue two, but I think I like this more than issue two. Um, about probably in line with issue one, where I'm just like, mm -hmm. freaking love this. I give this a nine out of ten. This is... Hell yeah. Very good comic book. Love it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I also gave it a nine out of ten. It's such a good yeah, issue. It's, it's such a, a good, good book. comic book. Uh, it's not a police wreck, though. Like, this is not one to yeah, jump in yeah. in the middle. Uh, but absolutely, if, I agree. You, if you see issue one and issue two grab all three like this is a, a, Fully a agree. series pull do we know if this is a mini too or if this is like I going longer i don't think we know i would love for this to be an ongoing not gonna lie but it certainly no, seems like uh, three of five three of five oh of five not even six not oh, even no. six we've got a very limited oh, time no. with the displaced I'm maybe you'll get extended that, but you know, three out of five issues, and they've they've kept up the momentum. Right? So that is you love fantastic. Yeah. Are we ready for the end of a mini series? The end with yeah, Lotus, Lotus Land. Land number six. Lotus Land number six. When the devastating secrets of the Keeper program and the Drowning Girl are finally revealed, Benny will have to make an impossible decision with millions of lives at stake. But what will it cost him? Being at odds with Melinda during this crucial moment, what will become of the program and Benny himself? The writer is Darcy Van Polgeist of Little Bird and Critical Role, The Tales of Xendria. The artist is Chow Felipe, Nightwing, Superman, and Stranger Things. The colorist is Patricio Del Pecci with assistant colorists Beto Leeds and John Amarillo. And the letterer is Nate Picos. Katie, we've been all over the place, I think, with this, been so all over with the place. this series. Um. And now we're Did at the it stick end. the landing? Did it stick the landing in your opinion? Is the question. Well, I want to preface by saying last month 
I made a commitment and I forgot about it <laughs> and did not too, fulfill it. Uh, I was going to reread the uh, five preceding issues before we did issue six. And then I did not. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll have to read the trade like as its own thing. That's literally what point. I was thinking. I think that we'll, yeah. down the line, there will be a bonus episode that is... Yeah. A, a breakdown of Lotus Land if you read it in its Agreed. entirety. Because it didn't feel like it stuck it for me. Like, there was so much built up and there, there I guess there's so much release that I had just yeah. gotten no build up for because, you know, issues and issues passed. And like, I like where it ended but i felt like it just didn't feel like it had any real build like this mm. entire issue felt like the back half of an issue to me uh like you cuz you're you're put right in the middle of things which isn't necessarily a bad thing but with a new world uh like a completely original world and all of these like mystery elements going on it's so it's so hard to like keep that energy month to month and i don't think the book does itself any favors with that uh in the way that it was written and like i do want to say it's gorgeous i think that the concepts are still super super cool i think that the uh the writing is still super super competent it's just the way i don't know that it was written in a way to Re reinvite people in on the monthly. How did you? I'm say? gonna I'm gonna maybe say something really weird about this issue. I'm ready. The first thing I'm gonna say is I think Chow Felipe leveled up even better in the, like oh, the yeah. art in the this art issue. In this entire is series has been phenomenal. This issue in particular, us down. Um, but I'm gonna try to and, and I'm gonna put the twist to the side because yeah. I don't know how to feel about that. Um. Plus, put that this to is the, the polis wreck. We don't deal with yeah. spoilers in the polis yeah. wreck. I'm going to put that to the side. I feel like this issue was a good issue and was perhaps my favorite issue of Lotus Land. And it even was a good finale. I'm going to say all three of those things. I think all three of those things are true. I think where it fails is based on the first five issues. I was waiting for the issue that would put it all together and retroactively make those issues better and make them make sense. I don't think it did that. I don't mm. think it elevated the series as a whole or the previous issues. I do think it was the easiest to follow and best issue on its own because I didn't feel as lost in this issue. And I thought there was a lot of cool stuff in this issue. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's my, my scatterbrain thoughts on, on this issue <laughs> because it's a, it's a hard one to, to nail down. No, it, it is. And I agree with you that there's so much good about it. It's it's just that sensation of feeling like I changed the channel and tuned into the last episode of yeah. a show that I had not been keeping up with. Uh, yeah. just it's it's so rough because I think that I'm gonna really really enjoy reading it in its entirety because I really like the world. Issue one was my favorite issue because I feel like we got a. Uh, so much going on with that and and we got introduced to all of these cool things and i Why can like pin like issue two more than issue one i like, might I didn't like him in issue one if i'm not mistaken and then like issue you might two, be thinking of like, the oh, one hand i could be wrong no i know that too because i didn't I know like that i didn't I thought, like Benny's... i thought you didn't like i thought you didn't like lotus Land one that much if i'm not mistaken but we'll, we'll we'll i might be conflating the two uh like just pushing one and two into the same yeah. issue yeah. Um, I could be doing the same thing, honestly. So don't don't take me at my word here. Go back and watch whatever the hell episode. Six probably somewhere ago. around five or six. You know, whatever the hell it, yeah. it, it was five months ago. But yeah. Um. But yeah, it's it's oh, it's just rough to feel like for this entire book, I've felt like the issues weren't meant to be issues, and that it's meant to be read as yeah. a trade, and to get to the conclusion to be like, ah, yeah. I think this needs to be read yeah. all I'm very at once. interested to read it as a trade. Yeah. And I'm optimistic, but I'm also a little worried that, like, because 
I don't know if I buy that it's going to have this like perfect through line if you read it in a row because it feels kind of jumpy in its mm-hmm. focus. But we'll, we'll have we'll to see. Uh, we'll we have will to find see. out. We'll certainly do that. Keep an eye out for Again, that I, thought, episode, I think you, sure. you nailed it though that this feels like the conclusion to like something else, but like a good conclusion to that something yeah, else. Yeah, you know? yeah. I'm like I think that thing concluded well. I, I wish I got to see that thing, but I think it concluded well. <laughs> well, what would you what would you give Lotus Land number six and a numbered rating? Uh, it's tough because like I'm trying not to grade the whole series with which mm-hmm. is always the thing with a final issue. Like that you is kinda fair. wanna grade it like as like how did it end this series? How does it impact it? versus as an individual issue? The art's also just so ridiculously good. Yeah. I'm gonna land on a six point five out of ten. That's we are that's where I'm gonna win with that. Yeah. Okay. Six point five out of ten. Obviously not a pull list rack. It's you know no, the don't, last don't issue. Of the series. final. Yeah. No. No. Don't do that. Wait for yeah. the trade at this point. Wait for the yeah. trade. Um. But yeah, it just flowers to all of the different parts of this book that are so good. Yeah. And yeah. fingers crossed that awesome when reading world. it as the trade, it all awesome kind of comes together for us. Fantastic art. Good dialogue. It's just. It's all there. Sometimes the pieces don't quite yeah. fit together. Yeah. But, but we've got... Speaking uh, of parts that I certainly believe fit together. <laughs> speaking um, of parts that don't fit together because there's only one of the four left. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't have a puzzle anymore. He's alone. Uh, His brothers are dead. He's alone. We are you gonna know. go talk about the last Ronin in Let's the back issue review. Okay, so we are finally, finally, going to be talking about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles: The Last Ronin. Showing off your director's cut there. My my, if we want to get real fancy, my signed director's cut. That is real fancy. I have the issue one director's cut somewhere. But I have, like, I have issues perfect. one and four as single issues, so I just got the full volume. I have that hardcover. I have the New York Comic Con hardcover. I have the Director's Cut hardcover. I have all the cover A's of the main series, all the cover B's, multiple graded copies of some of my favorite <laughs> covers, and just a lot of Last Ronin stuff. Was it this you series where you were like saying it. that uh, the issues are literally worth more ungraded or uh, unsigned, was it? Yeah, a lot of them are <laughs> worth more unsigned because of how many, not just signings, but free signings they do. Like if you go to New York or San Diego Comic Con, and I assume other conventions as well, but I can only speak to those two. Like if you go, whatever the morning they're doing the signing is, they let like the first couple hundred people, they give you a wristband and you go and it's free and everybody signs it. This one, my, my director's cut, which I think is from, I think san diego uh luis delgado who's the colorist wasn't there so that's one less signing on that one but the rest is everybody a sign of the letter sean lee who well we'll get to the creative team but he <laughs> hasn't been at any of the signings so maybe if you get him to sign it that's the that's there the you go that's play. the the big ticket not yet, normally the case of the letter with, with nothing but love for letters <laughs> yeah but um yeah anyway but yes we're talking last into... ronin yeah, let's get into the, the, the blurb and the creative team, because a lot of people worked on this book. Um, but yeah, first, blurb. Who is the last Ronin? In a future battle-ravaged New York City, a lone surviving turtle embarks on a seemingly hopeless mission, seeking justice for the family he lost. Get ready for the final story of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, three decades in the making. What terrible events destroyed this family and left New York a crumbling post-apocalyptic nightmare? All will be revealed in this climactic turtle tale that sees longtime friends becoming enemies and new allies emerging in the most unexpected places. Can the surviving turtle triumph? So, creative team of this book. First, we'll mention Peter Laird, who didn't work directly on the book, but Peter Laird and Kevin Eastman came up with the basic storyline and pitch and everything, which is actually in the back of the director's cut. You can see the literal pitch pages, which is so cool. Um, So, that's Peter Laird, obviously. Mirage, TMNT, co-creator. Very important. Possibly the most important person working on this book is Kevin Eastman, um, who is, again, half of that pitch. Mirage, TMNT. Also co-writer of this book. Also did the layouts for all of the pages in this book. So, Which is and illustrated certain pages of this book as well. Um, then we have the writer 
of the book, the actual script writer, co-story writer, um, which is Tom Waltz, who is, of course, pretty famous for writing the first hundred issues of the main uh, TMNT series and stuff like, uh, you know, Armageddon Game uh, and Children of the Grave, if you want to go way back. Um, then the main artists on the series are the Escorza brothers, Isaac and Esau. They do the main uh, present day storyline and they uh, have worked on Heavy Metal magazine. Then for all of our flashback sequences, we have Ben Bishop, who has worked on a number of things, including Drawing Blood, which with Kevin Eastman, which is what led to this book actually happening. Funny story. And then we have um, Louis Delgado as the colorist and um, Sean Lee as the letter. I got the thrown off because my Sean list Lee? of credits on the page didn't have the letter, but I know the letter. So I was like, I can <laughs> just say that, but Throw it threw me there, off yeah. that it was on the page. But in any case, this is a wild book. A lot of people working on it. Very strange creative process to get to this book three decades after it was originally supposed to get made. Katie has very limited turtle experience. Basically, just the initial very beginning of the Mirage run. Yeah, if you've seen our TV Teenage Mutant Ninja, Ninja Turtles episode, uh, it was a yeah. back issue review a few weeks back. You know the extent of my turtle knowledge because it's yeah. basically that. Uh, like yeah. some limited exposure to the cartoon, but uh, you know this is this is essentially it. Jay has thrown me in literally with the first and the like canonically last possible story. <laughs> uh, I had to give you because it was important to read something before reading this. And yes. then Murad, yeah. Now maybe it would have been good if we had another two issues because the Fugitoid comes in this and the Fugitoid is oh yeah, not I a have no idea what you know uh, Honey yeah. something was. Professor Honeycut, the Fugitoid. Yes. yes. Um yeah, he is a few issues on from where we read in, in Mirage. But I do so. love, uh, just to kind of jump into it, I do love yeah, jump that... Yeah, um, I'm going to give you that, most of the floor here. That they really do pull it full circle. Like, I don't know, I'm assuming that uh, our mad scientist is a recurring villain throughout the entire T of Turtles lore, but it is yeah, rad. that's uh, Baxter Stockman, you met him. Yeah. No, that's what I'm yeah. saying. I'm assuming he's recurring oh, okay. after yeah. that as well. Yeah, um, yes. One of their biggest villains, yes. Yeah. Because obviously in the uh, bit that we read for Raj, we encountered Shredder in the Foot Clan and yep. uh, Stockman and his mouses uh, and other, you know, robotics. And it is really, um, it is really satisfying for me as someone who has now read two Turtles comics. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, three. I, I read the first volume of the Batman crossover. Uh, ah, that's true. Yes, that is true. Cow bummer. Um, Which also has Kevin Eastman. Oh, no, th does that one have Kevin Eastman artwork? Is it only volume three that has Kevin Eastman artwork in it? I have no clue. It was, like, two years ago. <laughs> Might only be volume three. But it no, is nice no. for me as a little turtle noob to really kind of have that, like, oh, there, there were, like, two characters who I didn't recognize throughout this the entire thing. And, um, and uh, whoever the, like, Japanese uh, representative of the... Oh, he's new. He doesn't... Oh, okay. Exist. He's new. Yeah. I kind of uh, assumed that he was... In most not... Turtle stuff, the Hamato clan is, like, this is one of the things that makes Last Ronin a little bit unique. In most things, the Hamato clan is, like, an offshoot of the Foot Clan or, like, a thing with the left, so it's really just the Turtles and Splinter mm -hmm. that are in that clan. The last Ronin idea of like full on two warring clans where they have these other senseis and these other clans living mm -hmm. in Japan and stuff. That's a very last Ronin. Gotcha. Speech, All right. Then there was really just the one character who was important who I didn't recognize. Which you was were literally like one issue away from. <laughs> uh, so that was like really cool to have as a new Turtles fan to really feel the gravity of these, you know, long, bitter rivalries between these uh, heroes and villains. Um, but just to run through, because I think it's very important for those yeah. who don't know the story of the last Ronin. Uh, yeah. Mikey is the last Ronin. Uh, yes. We see Not a... revealed until the end of issue one, though. Which, if you actually hear at the time reading it, was a big, big thing as people... Yeah, because they, they did cute started. things uh, to, to kind yeah. of misdirect. And by cute, I mean, like, heart-wrenching. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's so cute when he's about to kill himself and you don't even look, know which one he is yet <laughs> look 
All I'm gonna say is that it's a little cute that he has his dead brother's weapons and masks. Like it's it's a little cute. So sue Cute the word I would it's use. It's a little cute. But you know. <laughs> it's a little endearing. How about that? Uh, yeah, cause yeah, you know, it shows how much he loves his brothers, but Mikey is yes. the last Ronin and throughout the yeah. issues of the last Ronin, we see the conflicts that they've had after a, a fake peace treaty with, uh, the foot clan. And we see Oroku the, Peroto is the, yes. Is the yeah. Guy now, which is uh, Karai's daughter, Shredder's granddaughter, uh, grandson, jeez. Yeah. Karai's. Son, Shredder's uh, daughter's and, son. Uh, Shredder's grandson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, by the way, I am so mad we didn't get more of her in this. Oh my Karai gosh. Karai's awesome. I think I've said multiple times, like, Karai's one of my all time favorite comic book characters. I love Karai so much. She is so cool. And, yeah, um, no, fantastic. But we see Karai kill Raf when he uh, goes to avenge. Uh, well, I mean, avenge. But Splinter wasn't actually dead, so Raph was just like no, hothead he, running he, off. He, being his yeah. hothead itself, was a little bit ahead of himself, assuming that, yes. Shredder, uh, uh, that Splinter was dead. Goes uh, so she kills him. Yes. And he kills her, but doesn't like fully kill her. She like drowns and is in stasis She's now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is what then I believe leads to later when. Uh, uh, Hiroko? What was his first name? Hiroto. Hiroto. Hiroku Hiroto. Yeah. When he turns 16, he then gets control of the Foot Clan. Yeah, and he um, calls for peace, uh, at which point uh, he he massive. has teamed up with Stockman, Stockman in New York. Stockman always kind of works for uh, Shredder okay. to some okay. extent. So. Uh, yeah. so Stockman attacks the uh, Turtle Lair in New York, which ends in the death of Leo, I have his mask behind me. Uh, I and, got it from uh, Casey. And end of Casey, which tragic. I love Casey. Uh, and and then he of course turns on the uh, Hamato clan in Japan as well, killing Donnie and Splinter. And Mikey doesn't die, which frankly sucks for him because now he's left <laughs> with no family. So and well said. It look, it does. No, it does. <laughs> Uh, so we, we see him on this multiple quest. Times in this book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we see him on this quest as he tries to finish his destiny by finally taking out the Foot Clan and ending this feud. Um, in modern, well, future day New York, uh, yeah. where Shredder, uh, not Shredder, uh, does he have like I mean, a villain yeah, name? Shredder. Does he take yeah, on the Shredder man? Shred okay, they all yeah, take on the yeah. mantle of Shredder. They're, they're all, they all become a Shredder, yeah. Wonderful. Love just... that for them, frankly. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, he is. He has taken over New York. Uh, there's some really cool backstory in that where they like put up walls around the city to stop uh, the rising water from coming into it, which then like turns into a, a, a organized crime hotbed that Shredder like yeah. becomes lord over. It's really cool world building. Uh, yes. And it's a, a bit of a bummer. I know that there are sequels. It's a bit of a bummer to not have more of like the world that's happening in New York. Yeah. Uh, Cause we get a bit of it because surprise, surprise, this April this didn't die. Despite Mikey thinking she did. Uh, she in fact lost an arm and a leg, but gained a baby. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, so she, she has had a child who is now a teenager who has been through like contact with the mutagen uh, uh, has become sort of a mutant herself. Yeah. Um, and she is very much trying to mutant ninja her teenage years. Uh, yes. Be like a freedom fighter trying to fight back against Shredder uh, alongside April. Uh, yeah. Naturally, the heroes win in the end. Kind of. <laughs> uh, so they, they, they do some cool stuff uh, to, to take back the city. And then, of course, Mikey has his final showdown with the Shredder in which he defeats him and dies. Rip to Mikey, but like good for Mikey, frankly. He and then reunites with his brothers and Casey in the afterlife and father in the afterlife. Yeah, which is nice. Which I'm not gonna lie, I have had something in my eye for the past like three days. It's been bugging the shit out of me. I was crying at the end of this, and I'm just like, oh, perfect, it's gone. <laughs> so this thank you. Is, last I think I've said like there's like two comic books that have made me actually cry in my life, and this is one of those. One of those two, because no, it it's is absurd. Just... 
how I'm like, <laughs> I don't know if you just heard my voice thicken as I talked about yeah. this. Yeah. The juxtaposition of the like present world that Mikey is living in with these, um, you know, visions into the afterlife or, you know, kind of dream this connection to his brothers when they're all yeah. like young turtles again and they look so like Mikey looks so different here like he April mentions that like the mutagen has like grown him. he's like big he's bulky he's covered in all of these like yeah. scars I, I and think it's wounds. one of the benefits of using different artists for the different yes. times too is it really helps sell the like aging of him because we have young Mikey who was always done by Ben Bishop both in the dream like afterlife sequences and in the the past mm -hmm. then we have the the full modern day hulking mikey which yep. is drawn by the escorts brothers but then in the middle when we get kind of those mi that middle journey bit it's drawn by kevin eastman who's still kind of drawing the more mutated version but in like a smaller style and this stuff so it just creates this nice transition of like how he gets from normal ninja turtle to last ronin ninja turtle which is <laughs> i do want to briefly pause to appreciate the phrase normal ninja turtle um, it's become normal in, in our colloquial cult in our you know mainstream culture. no We're no you're so fair turtles. it's just very funny also um oh, yeah. but no seeing the juxtaposition of that and like the book is so dark like it's it's in like classic i think ninja turtles fashion in classic, like, Batman, Daredevil fashion. Yeah. It takes place at night. There's no getting around it. Yeah. It's like, this is a book that thrives in the darkness. And the, like, brightness of these afterlife scenes, it's just, it's so absurd to see. Because with something like a Batman book, you have that darkness all the way through. Even when Bruce is, like, in his cave or whatever. It's a fucking cave. Yeah. And, like, it it remains dark, and you don't normally get these, like, high contrast, brightly colored, bathed in light scenes. And it makes it just so emotional, because you realize how dark the book is, and how, like, used to that darkness you've become. And, and it just, it makes for such an emotional impact as you turn into those pages when you do. Like, it's... It's masterfully done. And I want to give a huge shout out to, uh, I know that you mentioned them at the top, whoever the colorists for this book are, because I feel like that was... Louis Delgado, such a, yes. Yeah. Freaking amazing colorist. Yeah, like, even aside from the, like, emotional impact of those page turns, just all throughout the issues, so good. But, like, really, I think that's what super sells the emotion. Like you said, Mikey looks completely different in these oh, yeah. pages, but the feeling of the pages really comes from the colors, I think. And that is There's just, just like so, red pages that I'm trying so to fucking from. cool. Um, Where's like that red? Oh, this is, this is actually one of my favorite colored pages. The yeah, Jay has there. pulled up an explosion scene. We love an explosion uh, with a good Where Mike intentionally explodes himself because he knows how like basically immortal he has become in his old age to yep. launch himself into the building during his initial push. Which is oh my the gosh. first to issue touch on, on his own. like wild immortality. Yeah, the end of the first issue, Mikey is dropped from the top of Shredder's fucking tower and crashes yeah. onto the ground. It is the most like, it is like the hardest impact I have felt in a like in terms of like yeah. physical impact. Yeah, it yeah. is so heavy it is so like weighty when we talked about radiant black we talked about how it had like that good kind of saturday morning cartoons rubbery action yeah, yeah. uh this is the opposite of that yeah this is like no. so weighted and yeah. everything in this book feels it like there are yeah. time there there are so many times when people are injured or killed and you feel those injuries you feel those deaths happening I think one of the, yeah. uh, I was going to say worst, but I, I guess I mean best, uh, was with Raph's death. As, uh, Raph's we're going to touch on the deaths uh, in more detail, uh, or we will have already, uh, this past yeah, Sunday. Yeah. Uh, we've got a, a, a tier list of iconic comic book deaths uh, dropping then. Um, but, like, Raph is wrestling with uh, Shredder's daughter, <laughs> underwater and they're like in this in this in this scrap 
and he's like grappling her to drown her and she stabs him and it's so good. It's just so well done. Yeah. Yeah. But I have mean, talked is... a lot for uh, yeah. us reading your favorite book. Yeah, this is and, and, and like, this is now probably nearing the tenth time I've read this book. Um <laughs> and I am at the point where this is just my favorite comic book of all time. Like I love this comic book. On every conceivable level. It makes me feel, I think, more than any other comic book does. Like, it just genuinely pulls on those emotions. And then, like, throwing it all the way back for his... Like, reading the first issue when there are no other issues out at this point. Like, it's such a good one-shot. Oh. Like, I don't know if you... Because, like, this is before we get flashbacks. This is before we introduce, you know, really... The last page is introduced, you know, uh, Casey Marie. But we don't really know she's Casey Marie uh, mm. uh, yet. And April comes back. But up until, like, if you go just the first issue through the about to commit Sapuku, like, that is such a well-paced and well-done one-shot. Like, of, right. okay, there's one Ninja Turtle left. He's hearing these voices that we don't fully know what they are, but it's eventually we kind of figure out they're his brothers. And he's going, and he's got this quest to break into this building. And it's essentially, and this is actually true of both the first and the last issue. There's essentially 30-some-odd page fight scenes. Yeah. And that's it. And that and was something that amazing. I definitely wanted to hit on is uh, we talked about this with the Mirage Turtles uh, a few weeks ago. The ability of this 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 comic, the, this property, Eastman and Laird, whatever the, the force driving it is, to just hold on to momentum. It's absurd. Yeah. Like, these books move in such an... Yeah impossibly fast but followable way yeah. like everything feels like it is moving forward like it yeah. never feels like we stop it never feels like we take a step back everything yeah. is moving forward and Full, it's fully so agree. so good and, and one of the things that i think drives this like that extra level not that i don't absolutely love the mirage books that we have <laughs> spoken of is in addition to the amazing art team that you now have these an exceptional artist and, and Kevin Eastman is still an exceptional artist. He did the layout, so it's still all his placement and stuff, and he's an amazing at using placement and space and all of that. And that's still here. And then you have the Scores of Brothers who do gorgeous art and Delgado's, you know, uh coloring and the lettering from Charlotte. Like it's all fantastic. But what I think takes this that next level where you can get through 30 pages of just fighting and infiltrating, and that is Tom Waltz. Because he does a couple things, I think, about as well, if not better than anybody else in the industry. And those things are, one, really freaking good at, like, not limited use, but, like, very smart use of captions. His captions mm -hmm. aren't, like, one caption. Is, like, an entire page might have captions. He's but not all, like, Scott one Snyder in it. I say with nothing yeah. but love for Scott Snyder. Yeah. And two, which is really why Tom Waltz is my favorite writer, I think he's the best dialogue writer in comics. It's like, it is so really good. Fucking good. When he sits, when you have there, and it's not even, like, it's not even the other turtles. And if you read his, you know, IDW run, you can read all four turtles interacting, which is amazing. But in this, it is Mikey interacting with himself through, like, ghosts of his brothers that he's imagined. And that's what paces these when we have an entire issue where no other character is really introduced except for Mikey. But you get through it because it's these ghosts of his brother that he's communicating with. And that keeps yeah. emotion and personality and all of this. And you kind of get the other three turtles' personalities like turned up to eleven because it's like Mikey's, you know, thought yeah. of them. It's like ah, yeah, it's... Raph's gonna be as much of an ass as possible because that's what I'm, you know, thinking of. And and Leo is only gonna be on my ass about making sure that I'm doing every bit of strategy perfectly and thinking about all of this right. And Donnie's gonna keep calling me an idiot for not quite getting everything. And it's just so good, and I love it's it. It's so good. And obviously I came into this with the knowledge that Mikey was the last Ronin uh, because yes. I, I don't think it's possible to be friends with you and not Blown know away. that. Uh, it was so interesting to see in that first issue how much more subtle the characterization was yeah. in the ghosts. It was very much still there. I was still trying when reading to be like, oh, which, which brother is that? Which brother is that? Yeah. And yeah. I think that you know, it doesn't have lines going to them, so there's no definitive answer, I suppose. But yeah. you can still really see the foundations of it. And with the knowledge that the reveal wasn't until later, I was like, okay, I want to see where he's trying to, like, 
throw people off where he's trying to keep it up in the air. And the ball yeah. really is in the air. Like, the the speech all feels distinct enough that you can be like, I, I think this is this one, I think this is this one. But there yeah. are ones where it's like, oh, could be Mikey, could be Mikey. Yeah. And Absolutely. I can only imagine what a fucking rush it was to get to yeah. the end and learn which turtle it was. It, it was great because, like, the lead-up, and, and there's been a lot of, you know, how it comes in entertainment, people, like, retroactively like to to, to kind of change things and be like, no, right. this was, this was... So I hear a lot of people being like, oh, Mikey was the... Because retroactively, Mikey is the obvious choice. Like, the idea of taking the fun-loving yeah. turtle and going, like, yeah, he's got... And there's the fantastic line from Casey Marie where she's like, you're the funny one, right? This is going to be fun. And you've just read an entire issue of him being like... Yeah, that's not who he is anymore, Casey. Yeah, like, like that's girl, you literally cool. walked in on him, tried to commit seppuku. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, I feel like it's a nice acknowledgement for the audience of like, yeah, this is where Mikey started and this is where he is. Yeah. But it, like the lead up, at least from what I remember, um, was very much like, okay, it's Leo or Raph. Like, are they going right. to pick Leo or are they going to pick Raph? Are they either going to go, Raph's the obvious choice because he's the one who's already angry and pissed off and you take him even further. Or are they going to take like, you know, he was the, you know, the samurai ninja approach. master yeah. who lost all of his brothers who were following him, and it's his fault. And he has to, and even reading the first issue, you get to that, like, when we get to seppuku, it's like, oh, it's Leah. Like, nobody else out of the Ninja Turtles would commit seppuku. Like, that and is I mean, such it's a, even with his blade. Yeah, yeah, it feels so much like at that point, you're going, okay, this is Leo. And then you get that reveal on the left, and I remember just reading that and being blown away. In every level. And also, like, the big thing here is this was my, like, pullback in a Ninja Turtles. I was a huge Ninja Turtles little fan when I was younger, but I hadn't, I would read comics, but I hadn't really read Ninja Turtle comics. And then this idea, like, Last Ronin was pretty big. Everybody was talking about Last Ronin was coming. It was like, man, they're, they're going dark, like, really dark with the Ninja Turtles. Like, only one's left. And I heard this and I was like, fuck yeah, I'm gonna read that. So this was the book that I just grabbed and I read and then literally immediately went, okay, Let's get the Mirage books. Let's get this. Let's rewatch all the shows, all the movies. And this is what pulled me back in so much because that first issue on its own was just so grabbing and so captivating. But yeah, I love every bit of this. The last thing I want to talk about because I wanted to mention this because I think it's so freaking cool um, and, and kind of get your take on it because I know you you don't know quite as much about the behind the scenes as, as I do here. I would um, like to point out that Jay knows most behind the scenes things for turtles things and i know literally zero <laughs> <laughs> yes but so kind of the way first like i think this book is just such like proof of what collaboration in comics can do like there's such there's great things that come from like ah you have one guy you know who's doing everything where you have a writer and an artist and together they're doing it this is such a huge creative team. It's like two guys came up with the story a long time ago and then they brought in new people and these two people are co-writing it and then this guy's doing the layouts and then these guys are drawing it and then like it is so many steps and yet it comes it, it doesn't feel disjointed. You don't Not feel like all. like if we ever talk about DC generations on this podcast, we'll talk about <laughs> how collaboration can fail. Um <laughs> but this book is such a triumph of that. And one of the really, really cool things here is that the Escorza brothers do not speak English, you know, and you can do what you typically do where, you know, you, okay, it's going through a translator, whatever. As far as I'm aware, I don't know if this is published anywhere, but I've, I've heard um, Tom Waltz and Kevin Eastman talk about this at panels. And the way that they did this was not through putting it through a translator. It was through Tom Waltz writes script, Kevin Eastman does layouts, and then they just draw those layouts without a script, which is like, such a cool, literally, like, communication through art. Yes. Which is just awesome. <laughs> oh, my, I'm, yeah, I'm, that I'm is incredibly cool. And, I mean, I think I think Eastman's involvement in, like, every step of this process is part of what makes it such an it's amazing, such cool complete piece. Uh, because, like, it's it's so... It's got so much vision to it. And yeah. it really is just a phenomenal piece of art. And frankly, I hate giving things never ratings. And I feel like I'm going to fight you depending on what your number rating is. 
you're gonna fight me. You're gonna be very mad about my number. I am here. gonna fight you, and your dad's yeah. gonna help. We're both gonna beat you up. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Be um, a mortal dreamer no more. <laughs> <laughs> but just to just to, to hit on like last thing you said here, like Kevin Eastman being so throughout the yeah. book. Another great quote from from Tom Waltz is he he said that when he was approaching you know the IDW TMNT, which he also co-wrote with Kevin Eastman. He was Batman and Kevin Eastman was Robin. Like, Kevin Eastman was helping him, telling him, like, ah, oh, this is how Ninja Turtles goes. But he was the lead creative force. Mm-hmm. He said when it came to Last Ronin, he had to understand that that was switching. And now Kevin Eastman is Batman. And he is his Robin helping him bring Kevin Eastman's vision to life. Which is such a cool, like... Like, what an uh, insane, like, and rad dynamic to have with someone. Oh, yeah. What a team of co-writers make all of my favorite comic books. <laughs> awesome but yeah do you want to do you want to slap a rating on this first and uh then i hate numbers we can, ah. we can you know um top 10 list this this biatch <laughs> he says about his favorite comic book ever <laughs> this biatch <laughs> it's a okay. good comic book <laughs> it's, a, it's an incredibly good comic book i i hate numbered ratings so much like the top ten know. list, I fuck with. I'm I'm down for the top <laughs> ten list because like I can say confidently that I like this better than this and this yeah. better than this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but it's well, just maybe so t- maybe we'll you know eventually because we're like not to not to we'll we'll get on to this more in the outro this week, but we're yes. going to be playing around a little bit with the the back issue formatting. Yeah. So maybe the the number ratings will go away after this, and we'll just focus on Thank the top ten list. Fucking we'll, Christ, I hate number. <laughs> we'll see. But we'll see. You, you know, you have to still do it for this one. I do still have to do it for this one. I am going to give this a very good rating, but I do want to add the caveat that as someone who has not built the same relationship to the turtles, I can understand yes. why, like very objectively, why uh, my strong emotional reaction is only a fraction of what the emotional reaction would be for someone who uh, grew up with the turtles. Yes engages with a lot of yeah. the turtle stuff it's like reading dark knight returns without reading you know batman comics before that or exactly about batman. It's like, uh. i'm gonna give this an 8.5 out of 10 you know that's still a great rating that's yeah still it a is very, and very i debated rating. going a little higher but the numbers yeah. i hate numbers <laughs> and i'm like trying yeah. to remember what the numbers are rounded on the list are where i've decided to put it and i'm like <laughs> i don't remember what i gave anything i'll give it an 8.5 <laughs> All right, um, Jay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Mr. Yeah, Jacksonowski, yeah, yeah. get your fists ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm trying to math here really quickly. Just give me like one Don't. second. There we go. Just, That's what it is. That's he's is. literally okay. doing the halfway point between nine point seven five and ten. <laughs> so I'm giving this I'm book, beat this which is my up. favorite comic book of all time, a nine point eight seven five. Or sorry, eight two five is is how that math. Wait, how does that math out? You don't five. deserve oh, no, the that's correct right. math. That's right. You're that's, just that's, wrong. That's right, I think, right? That's Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's, Mr. That's James Maskey, get him! No, 9.875 is where his book is landing. He is right above me. <laughs> He's right above <laughs> but, me. <laughs> but, yeah, so that's where we're landing with this because, you know, it could always be a better book, you know? This is, this is, this is right now the peak of comic books. But one Simply day, just oh, an emphatic fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh super my gosh. Fabulous. but top 10 list do you want to hit up the top 10 list first while I, will, I, I, I will I run through my top 10 list bit. first alright top of my list Noctera full throttle dark number 2 New Teen Titans volume 1 number 3 Above Snakes Last Ronin is slotting in at number 4 Ooh, beating out number nice. 5 Hawkeye My Life is a Weapon number 6 Maze Buck Number seven is the Mirage TMNT 1 through 3 in the RAF one shot. Number eight is Batman and Robin Volume 1. Number nine is Chicken Devil Under Pressure. And number 10 is Pretty Deadly Volume 1, which is kicking off World's Finest Batman and Superman, the Devil Neza. Wow. And Pretty Deadly's getting down there, which honestly, Pretty on my Deadly list, is getting down. too, looking at it now, which is wild. Wow, Jay, I wonder really where you put Last Ronin. in. Want to run through your number list? Number one on my list us? is going to be. The last Ronin. Number two on my list is the Mirage TMNT 1 through 3 in the RAF one shot. Number three is Noctera Volume 1. Number four, Batman and Robin Volume 1. 
Number five, New Teen Titans, volume one. Number six is Maze Book. Number seven is Above Snakes. Number eight is Radiant Black. Number nine is Pretty Deadly. Number 10 is Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths, which is getting real close to being bumped off. And Thank heavens. Uh, goodbye, Cyborg Rebirth, volume one. We hardly knew thee. You have fallen off my list. You lasted longer than I would have thought. Two weeks, right? Yeah. Yeah. It didn't even make my top ten. <laughs> it didn't make your top ten list. That's that's fine. That's fine. I love this book so much, though. Um, yeah, good stuff. <laughs> Not enough to give it a ten, though. There is no such thing as a perfect creative work. In any case, we have an interview <laughs> with Lewis Southern of Midnight Western Theater, uh, as well yes. as Villain Seeking Hero, as well as Comics Are Dying the Comic. Uh, we recorded this a while back, so you might hear us asking some questions about Comics Are Dying that have since been publicly answered. Uh, it is but... on Zoop. Just just when we, when we are dancing around where it's going to be, it is on Zoop. You can go to Zoop right now. We're sorry. Yes, we will. We will have it linked for you. Uh, yes. Super excited to share an interview with Lewis with y'all. Let's head over. Should be fun. Okay, so today we are joined by Lewis Southard. He is the writer on Villain Seeking Hero, Midnight Western Theater, Lewis Southard's Terrifying Tales to Keep You Yourself, Midnight uh, Western Theater Witch Trial, The Blackout Bombshell, and currently in production, Comics Are Dying, The Comic. Thank you so much for joining us. Joining Thank us, you Lewis. so much for having me, Joseph. And hello there, Katie. It's, hello it's, there. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be here. I was so ecstatic to get your offer to pop onto the show. And I'm always available to talk about myself. So that was certainly <laughs> not a, a difficult thing to say yes to. And, uh, and yeah, I, I'm just here to talk comics. And I'm very excited to do that. Awesome. Well, we, we always start with the same question for when we have creators on which is how did you actually start working in comics how did you make that jump if you were a fan first into actually you know writing them and then eventually getting them published okay well we already had a long discussion before this and it all started with you asking one question I, i'm getting a <laughs> vietnam flashback because you have just asked me a question that is i hope you have another spare 20 minutes for me to talk because now here we go if you want to talk about, okay, how did you two become fans of comics? I will, can you two talk for two seconds before I, I go into uh, that? Like, what was the book that got you into the, into the whole thing? Green Lantern Lost Army uh, by Colin Bunn and Jesus Saez. Oh, that's pretty good. Gosh, mine was just the entirety of Batman's No, Man, uh, Batman no Man's <laughs> Land. I was a little gremlin in the library and saw a shelf full of one book. And I'm like, that's it. I'm going to read that. Okay. So, so fan of, <laughs> fan of comics, um, my first ever comic book was Spider-Man Noir, Eyes Without a Face, issue number one. Uh, I think that came out 2009. I was nine years old. So, like, I, I was like, oh, heck yes. Black suit Spider-Man, kind of like more like Batman. I'll give this a go. It's probably like high flying exploits. And then it's just like this very sultry noir, like black cats running like a club. And it's like, I got to, I got to stop these people from running drugs in this town doll. Like we gotta, it's like, we, we gotta stop this from happening. And it's just like, what is this? Like, this is, this is not what I was promised. Um, so then I didn't read any comics after that. Um, and then, uh, 2013, um, I had heard that Spider-Man was dying. The real Spider-Man, not this crazy Batman Spider-Man, the real one. And it's like, <laughs> oh, cool. Like, this is interesting. <clears throat> and uh, I hopped in around Spider-Man 670, no, 698. I remember the cover is Dr. Octopus dying on his deathbed. And he just says, Peter Parker. And it's like, okay, that's cool enough to, uh, to get me in. And I started that, and then my first ever run that I got in from the beginning, and I read it to the end, I love it to this day, was Superior Spider-Man. Like, that was my favorite thing, and where I was uh, at that point in my life, I'm 13, I'm mad at the world, I'm 
bursting with uh, puberty, like ready to start fires. And I like, I have to overthrow the government or I have to do something right now. <laughs> like I like, like having a book about like a very disgruntled, very like angry character learning to mellow out and like think differently and, you know, be a, be a more efficient human being definitely was what that teenage boy me needed at that time. So that was truly a, a godsend. Uh, so yeah, so that got me into comics and I never stopped reading. And then um, I was 18. This goes into the other thing of how, how did I get into comics, writing comics? I was 18. Everything had been fallen apart in my life. I, uh, I lost, I, uh, I lost family. I lost friends. Uh, tragedy struck left, right in the center. And, um, I'm in a completely different part of the world. I'm in Paris, France, and I am losing my goddamn mind. And I'm like, okay, I need to take a step back and I need to evaluate what do I want to do in my life? What do I want to do? And I realized that I want to make comic books. And I'm like, I, I told my, I spoke to a lot of different family members. I spoke to a lot of um, uh, 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 adult figures at that point being like, mm -hmm. hey, I want, I have this plan for my career. I'm going to drop out of university. Is that cool with everyone? And then it's like. <laughs> everyone was just like oh yeah give it a go who cares <laughs> so it's just like oh, well that's the green light i needed um so i moved back to america i moved to new york uh and i became i i started to learn how to write in comics how to make comics and i had a brilliant idea when i was starting out I'm going to make my first book and it's going to be like in a 100 issue ongoing series. <laughs> and I'm going to get that off the ground. And not only that, it's going to be a superhero epic. And I'm like, uh, a publisher will be dying to get that from me. And I, I yes. will be famous. I'll be famous overnight. Um, that did not happen. Uh, <laughs> that did not happen. In fact, uh, that was my first lesson in the comic book industry. That that's not how any of that works. And that's <laughs> and if anything, every little like every minute detail there was perhaps the worst <laughs> angle I could have done for my debut book. But if it weren't for that book, we probably wouldn't be here today. And that was a uh, villain seeking hero. And uh, I, w I signed up with Action Lab. I, mm -hmm. I got a publishing deal the first year in, and they, got, they picked up 18 issues of the series. And I was like, hell yeah, uh, the, the money's going to be rolling in. <laughs> Perfect. Nothing can stop me now in the year of 2019. Oh boy, <laughs> clock, strike 12. It's 2020. It's all up from here. And then, uh, you know, the entire world went on vacation. And uh, the, the comic book industry nearly blew up. And then the company that I was a part of disappeared. So, so yeah, not great. So that was, I, I was, I was doing, I had a meeting the other day with uh, an editor and he's 38 and I am, I, I'm younger. And he was like, Oh, you know, like, I know you're a younger guy, but I want to let you know, like, when we're doing these sessions, I'm going to be a bit tough with you, you know, like, I'm going to tell you the stuff you aren't going to want to hear. And I hope you're okay. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. And I'm like, who the, f who do you think you're talking to? <laughs> like, I have been through the <laughs> ringer, like, in the comic book industry if the worst thing you could do is tell me I don't like that, I will bow down at your feet and be like, you're the nicest person I ever met in my whole life. Oh my like, God. Like, so it's just like, yeah, no, like there's nothing at this point that the industry can throw at me that I would be too surprised by. And uh, I got over my hurdle and now I make books people actually want. And uh, there you so, go. you know, certainly turned around 
I will say that we are both fans of uh, Villain Seeking Hero, though. So that is definitely a book that people do want. Uh, Where did you two uh, uh, read up to? Um, I have read up to, I want to say, somewhere around 12. I was okay. rereading it this week, and I reread through, um, I think, 10. We read through the the um the the first issue with Lady Liberty and um Master Molecule like together during their like regular life. Uh that's where I, I, I kind of re hit. Um but yeah, I think it was through twelve. I don't remember how far you went on Zest World, but that was I think about uh, as far as I remember uh going with it. But yeah. Well, I, I'm not gonna lie, I've been so busy, I've been slacking. So like uh the remaining six issues, which I think have some of my absolute favorites. Um they that I still have to upload them. Um, I I I've never I, I don't think I've ever actually spoken to people who have read Villain Seeking Hero. So it, it's it's funny. I dug up our DM because literally yeah. I think it was like January of 2023. I sent Katie the link to Villain Seeking Hero on Zestful. I'm like, read this. It's really good and fun. <laughs> what do you what and, do you um, what do you like about it? It's it's, it's just, so funny. It's a good time. Yeah, it, it's. It honestly feels like it was made by somebody who loves superhero comics and just wanted mm-hmm. to kind of start twisting stuff. You know, there's very much like you kind of go on an arc and then you, you'll take like a, a sharp left and do a different arc that like is very unrelated. So it just felt like reading somebody who was doing whatever they wanted to do for that particular issue, which was, you know, I don't know, a breath of fresh air in like the current market of everything's a six issue heavily planned out, you know, full story that has a, you know, full thing. It felt more, you know, uh, like... I guess what we got into comics reading, you know, like yeah. superhero books that just keep going. Um, so that's personally why I liked it so much. I don't know about Katie. No, I think it's one of those things where you can really tell uh, kind of like what you were saying when it is a kind of a call from inside the house. Like, <laughs> like a month or two ago, we read Battle Pope, uh, which was yeah. Robert Kirkman's, uh, you know, weird superhero parody book. And the thing that we kept coming back to is, wow, this is clearly written by someone who has so much love for what this is a joke about, which makes it feel like it's a joke for us as comic book readers and comic book fans, uh, as opposed to a joke at the expense of comic book readers and comic book fans. Uh, My favorite ever review I ever got for it was somebody identified it as a reconstruction because it's like somebody said that it's not mean-spirited all the time it's it's more <laughs> like it's just like taking it apart putting it back together again in in different ways uh i ah uh, yeah no that book i think i think that book suffered a bit because i did have to build up uh to the twist that the main villain character is married to his arch nemesis yes. <laughs> so it's but what like, a twist yeah no and a twist I, with like good foundations as well like in the interactions we see between them yeah, like she does save him before that in like the I, I can't think of what your like Justice League parody team is called right now, but like in the Super fight with sad, them, he gets like shot in the space and she like rescues him. And so you know, there was there's foundations there. Yeah, no, there and was. And even in like the... the opening scene, they're interacting and there's there's clearly some chemistry going on there. And you get to see no, that them was doing always this a... forever. It's so great. Yeah, no, that was always planned out. Uh, I I love that book. Now you have me thinking about that. Like, I love the whole Skull Commander arc where, like, the whole reason why he's launched this supervillain plan is just he misses his friend. Like, he just wants his... Skull Commander is awesome. I love... I love Skull Commander. Like, I I don't know if I could ever do the whole story. So, Lewis's greatest secrets revealed. Like, he, he had, like, this whole... Okay, no, I'll tell you about the unmade volume four. This is a scoop for your 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 thing. So, volume three, which you'll be able to read, um, it is. Let me think. The issue thirteen is there is a color themed super, like a rainbow themed supervillain gang that kidnaps another rainbow themed supervillain simply because they don't like that they st- he stole their gimmick, and then it's like it's not right. Like we deserve it, and then like they're sent to mediate it. Um, then like the other one was a, a young kid grows up admiring master molecule and he becomes a supervillain. And it's like, my whole dream is to meet him. 
And then it builds up to him like, oh, I, there he is. I'm going to say hello. And then he's like, get the hell away from me. And then he just like goes about his business and then that just fractures his mind. Oh, God. Uh, the issue, the, 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 the next two was a two-parter where Spirit King is mistaken as a superhero after he stops a nuke from going off. And like he just rolls with it. And then Master Molecule is just like, He's lying. Nobody, <laughs> nobody listened to him. Like, but everybody's like, Spirit King, Spirit King. And then like, um, but, and then like you get a bit more of like his psyche. Cause he, even though he's doing it, he feels really guilty about a lot of, he's like, I don't deserve this. I'm a fraud. Like blah, blah, blah. And then the, my favorite two, the next two were, um, super, uh, Spirit King and Nightman go to a supervillain nightclub and thing goes everything goes off the rails i think my favorite bit was nightman just ditches him halfway through to go to like subway and then like get a sandwich and then go home and then spirit <laughs> king just basically goes on a haphazard date um and then the last bit was a uh, a one shot about a young woman kind of like an evil peter parker that's the way I th- like she's poor She's trying to get her job going, but she can't really do anything about it. But she does have like a bunch of super villain equipment that she's like, well, I'm just going to do this once in a blue moon to get some money and help my life out. But I'm not going to be a super villain. I'm just going to do this on the down low every now and then. But then, of course, in the villain seeking hero thing, it it just goes horribly wrong (laughs) right away. So um, volume four, the unmade volume four was going to start as a Suicide Squad Mike Mignola uh, homage where <clears throat> Master Molecule and this new character, the Locust, are accidentally drafted into this, this, universe, this universe's version of the Suicide Squad. And they're dumped into, like, Brazil where they have to hunt down, like, science Nazis and like it, they, the science Nazis are trying to summon Ghost Hitler, and then like <laughs> it just it just keeps escalating, and everyone starts dying, and then they eventually they're just like, "What are we gonna do?" And it's like, "I'm just gonna shoot at the thing, and maybe it'll it'll work." <laughs> and then of course it works, and then like <laughs> and then like the rest of the volume, like Master Molecule is like, "Yeah, I killed Hitler the second time," and everybody's like, "Yeah, yeah." <laughs> Sure you did, pal. And then, um, (laughs) what was it? You got to see what a spirit king does when he's not the spirit king. And it's that he is a a really good uh, high school um, English teacher. Because he is, he is, but like the way he was going to be designed was like, he wears glasses, but he still has his glowing yellow eyes. He wears like a purple button up black pants he still wears his cape he still wears his like super villain gloves and he wears his boots and the thing it was like a whole clark kent thing and like every he's really good at being an english teacher too which was the saddest bit because at the end of the issue he has to give it up (laughs) he has to put it out there yeah he has to leave it all behind to just focus on being a super villain but um the 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 entire staff and the students love him but the gym teacher, who's a bald guy, is the only one who's like, he's clearly like a super villain. And everyone's like, you're crazy, Greg. You don't know what you're talking about. And then um, and then the last bit was a Nightman story arc because I never got to really flesh him out. And that was like, it was like, I don't want to, uh, that, that's too much technical info. I don't care. <laughs> You, you got enough. You got enough. <laughs> so, <laughs> Very true. Well, certainly enough to be bummed that we would get to actually see it on the page. Maybe one day. Maybe one day. See, that's your problem. Uh, you started talking about that. I'm like, oh, cool. Now I get to I get to say these bizarre things that only mean something to me and only a handful <laughs> of other people on the entire globe. So enjoy well, that, listeners. Well, you can hear devotees. Uh, <laughs> they're going to come out of the woodworks. <laughs> Now everybody just has to go back and read all villain seeking hero, and then they'll they'll get it. And it'll yeah, be great. Yeah. It's not <laughs> again good for available podcasts. on web too. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's great podcasting content for sure. <laughs> but yeah, kind of speaking a little bit more on uh, you know seeking villain was evolved. You were 
a little involved with Zest World for a little bit there, do, between re-releasing um, Villain Seeking Hero on there, and then that's also, I believe, where you did uh, Lewis Southard's uh, Terrifying Tales to keep to yourself. So, what was that experience like, kind of partnering with uh, Zest World? Um, well, they're not around anymore. Maybe <laughs> I am the bad luck thing. I think, uh, I, see, I, I, I hope, uh, no, no, that's not true. I had nothing to do with that. Uh, they, yeah, they just went, they came and went, um, they were looking for newer creators to, they're not newer, like they wanted more creators on their platform. Um, I sent in an application, they approved me. Um, and the big series that I launched with was, uh, Lewis Southard's terrifying tales to keep to yourself. Uh, that's definitely not like my most proudest work i can't say like i'm like my magnum opus is right there but certainly a good um it was like a good little respite between all the other projects like oh this is just like a fun little thing um it was just like five stories it was the mouse in the house um they're all horror stories uh the mouse in the house um how's how to, how to seduce commuting women on the train um <laughs> What was the other one? Um, the End Knight, uh, Do Skeletons Dream of Dead Sheep, and Penny and the Mechanical Mister Strawberry, and they were all they were all very nice and you know like nothing nothing to write home about, but it made me very happy at the time, and uh, and then eventually, like you said, I republished Villain Seeking Hero on that website, and uh, everything was cool for a hot second, and then eventually I get an email from their big boss and it's like oh hey um can you have a meeting with me and i'm like oh no what did i do now like what did i <laughs> what did i do to screw things up and uh he's like hello lewis thank you for meeting me on this fine day and i'm like uh hi charles like what can what can i do for you and then it's like unfortunately zest world is shutting down and, and i'm like oh um, I'm sorry, Charles. And it's like, yeah, thanks, man. And it's just like me comforting him, like, oh yeah, I really wanted to work and then it didn't go. And then I'm like, well, I really believed in it and I liked it and you did good shit and blah blah blah. And then I'm like, well, thank you, and uh you know, thank you for the opportunity. And he's like, Yeah, and then I quickly went over to Zest World and I got rid of everything from the platform because he said that the website at a certain date was going to be locked. And you couldn't ac- you couldn't edit or access your accounts anymore. So mm-hmm. I was just like, okay, I'm gonna purge quickly, take everything back, <laughs> and then go into the night like I was never here. So, <laughs> so yeah, I, I that's that's my Zest World experience, which is, uh, yeah, that's just what happened. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that you did horror with them. You did superheroes with a uh, uh, villain seeking hero. Uh, you did Western with Midnight Western Theater and a kind of very classic uh, detective story with Blackout Bombshell. And one thing I noticed is that your dialogue really morphs with your stories. Uh, like you really get the voices of your characters, not just, you know, who they are as individuals, but as individuals in that particular time period, that particular world. Is there anything specific you do to like prepare to write dialogue for these kind of, uh, you know, archetypical settings? Uh, that's a really good question. Craft. Uh, so I think, <clears throat> I think with all my books, I start with, I, I draw the characters myself. Uh, at least, not maybe not the final design, but at least the, the, the first ever sketch. So I'll draw them, and then I will like kind of think about what their personality is like. And, you know, give them a few defining traits, but not flesh them out too much. You know, give them a name, give them some traits, have an idea in your head. And then <clears throat> when I start writing, I always think like the character will tell me what they will do. And then I will go from there. Um, Blackout Bombshell was a really great example of that because it all kind of started with just one idea, which is um, a guy wakes up in the car and he doesn't know how he got there. And then it kind of escalates that I'm somehow involved in a mystery and I have to solve it. So like, that's just an idea. That's nothing. Like there are plenty of people who will 
I, okay, tangent. I used to be a creative <laughs> consultant in New York, like, and people would hire me to help them out with some of their book ideas, their game story idea. Basically, if you had a, anything with a story, I'd come in and I'd just give you notes. And more often than not, you will encounter the same type of person, which is, I listen, I've created this world and there are these pirate ships and they fly in the sky and they're powered by these jewels. And each jewel, it's a different color. And when you put the different colored jewel into the oven, the pirate ship will have a different ability. Like it'll be able to shoot flames or it'll be able to transfer to, to other dimensions. And like, also this is like a two dimensional, three dimensional, fourth dimensional world. And you need the jewels to access each other dimension and this, that, and the other thing. And I, I would get a lot of those types of people. And then my first question would always be, who is your main character? And then it's like, what? I don't, what? Like, what do you, weren't you just listening to the jewel thing? Like, we don't care about the main character. And I, I think that's your first mistake. You need to come up with a main character, a, a voice for that character. And like, what do they want? Um, at least from my perspective, um, all the stories that you just listed, all the stories I make and all the stories I keep making, n none of them really are the same genre. They're not really the mm -hmm. same story. And I'd like to believe they don't sound 100% the same. I think if you were to read it, you'd be like, that's a Lewis book. But I don't think you could say like every character has the same voice. It, you know, mm -hmm. it's not like that. So I really pride myself in my dialogue and wanting to really make the characters feel real and human and that like they have little quirks or they, they are like proper scumbags or they're like quote unquote good people that do bad things or they're like, oh, you're a terrible person, but that terrible person does incredibly good things all the time. And like, like the different facets of that. So it's like, I get really bored by like, your simple character, but even your simple character can have like a lot of stuff going on if you play yeah. with the angles. And I guess that's, I hope this answers your question, but like, I, tr I really love having uh, multifaceted characters and with the dialogue, I really want every character to sound like them, not like mm -hmm. each other. And uh, I go out of my way to do that each and every time. Well, I think that definitely shows uh, in what I've read of your work, and it's really just great. Thank you. Well, fully agree. But let's 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 talk a little bit about comics are dying the comic because a hundred pages, a yeah. hundred artists. What an insane undertaking! How do you decide to do something like that? You get really pissed off. You get really mad one night. Uh, so. Um... I was, I'm a big fan of the Word Balloon podcast with John Suntries. Uh, I've been on there. He's a very nice guy. I talked to him once in a blue moon. And I think he's a very upstanding member of the comic book commentary community. And he offers a very good platform for a lot of amazing uh, writers and artists, as well as people in other industries. On one night, I was, this is the tail end of last year, so let's say end of December, I was listening to his thing where he was addressing the, the Mark Miller, uh, Mark Millar uh, cancel pigs thing. And uh, soon enough, the whole live stream or the whole show was flooded with trolls, cyberbullying him. And then, of course, the days prior, the, the internet, at least Twitter, a bit of Instagram, but like, all of comics social media seemed to be pretty negative of just like, I, there was that guy who made that video saying like, he doesn't like new characters in his comics. And the response to that, there, there are a bunch of different, like multifaceted is the word I'll use once again. So like the response to that is there are people who are like, I don't agree with this guy. Like I think the new characters are good for comics you know, like more diversity, you can have all the characters and they can exist in their own economic space. And that's a valid argument. The invalid argument is people making fun of him for his age or his appearance or uh, his, his anything about him like as a, as a human being. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's bullying. That kind of like bullying is not cool. 
uh, even if you're right, bullying, <laughs> good, best piece of advice I ever got was um, like, and I don't mean right, like, oh yeah, he is old, but like, right, like, oh, this person's not saying good things, uh, like, you know, that kind of way. But like, uh, best piece of advice I ever got is you could be a hundred percent right, but if you're an asshole about it, nobody will listen to you. And, um, I, I saw that I didn't like that. And then of course that was f- fueled the flames of all the comics gate and all like the trolls of being like, Oh, you, you damn liberals are ruining comics. And like, you're, you're, this is terrible. Like we need to, uh, this, yeah, it's all falling apart. Snowflake this, the, you all suck. Then the cancel pigs, like you're all bullies or you're all this that, And it just was like a cacophonous, annoying thing to see. And then like, then you see like people you like and m- even more people being affected by this like snowball effect. And then Mark M- Miller is fanning the flames. And it's just like, I got so mad about all these people whining and talking about comics are dying because of diversity or because this i don't like this storyline right now or like blah 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 and it's just and it's your fault because you make the comics and that's not good like whoever like and it's just like uh, that sucks and it's also very reductive if you're like right now comics are bad and everyone in it is bad because guess what you may be a fan but I'm in it and I know all the people, not all, but I know a good chunk of people making comics right now. There are so many lovely, talented, professional, good people who care making it. And they're right here right now. And maybe some people they're working their way up the ranks. Some people, they haven't gotten their shot yet. Some people there's just, they like they, they've been around the block, but they're still here and maybe they're not doing as much right now, but they still deserve their time to shine. And I just got mad about that. So I was like, screw it. I've had this idea in the back of my mind. I want to do this thing. I like, let's get all the great people that I know and go beyond that. So like it started with me, contacting mostly everyone I've ever worked with uh, in the past to get them to do a page. And then that when that has now spiraled into me meeting a lot of new and lovely people um, and collaborating with them on getting a hundred pages uh, with a hundred artists and eat this whole book. Uh, Comics are dying is just about the entire comics industry from its inception in like 1849 like at least the American comic book industry, 1849 or Western, I should say 1849 to the modern day. So each page is a significant or historical event done either in the style of what it's referencing or like it's homaging or riffing or being a bit serious about the subject matter. It is, um, it is about, and I am very, very satisfied and proud with how it is turning out. And if anything, it's helped me build a lot more connections with uh, people in the industry, as well as spreading a bit of positivity, at least amongst my peers and I. And that has been the most nice thing I think I've done in comics on a, maybe not on a professional level, because I don't see this making me billions upon billions of dollars, but like on a, on a personal level, it's been nice to kind of give back and work and make something that's more positive, optimistic and nice. So that's felt really good. That's really just so awesome. It's such a cool idea. It's so admirable that you've brought in so many creators. We are chomping at the bit to see it. We're so excited for it to, to come I together. Will, I, I will mention it. it has been picked up but an official announcement will come, I think, th- coming March, I sh- hopefully. So it's sooner rather than later. But right now I am managing 100 people is very stressful. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I, very fair. I am at 94 artists 
signed on. I need six Including left. Your, yourself, right? You, you signed yourself a page, I saw. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. Okay, yeah. No, that one is not me being like, I can do it too, everyone. Watch. Like, it's more like I had a very specific page that seemed like such a waste of time to give to an artist that it's just like I can easily just do it myself get the point across and call it so it's like I was like okay that's that's I I can do this I also need to save money because like I said I have a lot of pants and Big Macs that I need to keep (laughs) this lifestyle going and this is uh this is a quite a financial um risk and and certainly uh it's it's it is a it is it is a thing it is a thing so like i uh yeah i i you know what screw you guys i let me save some money let me do one page <laughs> let and me do get one that artist credit yeah yeah jesus <laughs> it's not my fault it's like oh wow you got oh, you got 99 people but one of them's you where's your integrity where's your integrity <laughs> This is a sham. This is a book built on lies. I hope you don't think I was calling out your integrity by mentioning that you were doing a page. And I already Ugh. saw. I well, well, Joe. I see Cancel Lewis trending on Twitter right now, so I don't. I can only I'm, I'm assume sorry. that. Live Thank you so much to Lewis Southern for that awesome interview. If you're wondering why it ended a little bit abruptly, we had a little bit of a uh, snafu Technical with the last little bit of the interview. Yeah, so we lost a little bit of it, but hopefully you enjoyed the bit that is still there. We'll have all of Lewis Southern's, you know, uh, social media and the link to Comics Are Dying, the comic down below. So hopefully you can find any info that you need there. Um, But yeah, still an awesome interview for the the bits that you've gotten to see. Absolutely. Uh, But we have uh, a, a release this past Sunday, Wacky for Us. We do! Uh, scroll back through the channel to find our tier list of iconic comic book deaths, including yes. three from The Last Ronin, which we just read yes. this week. Pretty thrilling. Yeah, um, and then... I don't know, do we have one coming up this weekend? It it depends on... We'll see. We're, we will have one up in the next two weekends whether it's this weekend or next saturday it will be this saturday or next saturday that remains to be seen based on how fast we can get things out the if you're wondering why this past sunday we had the deaths bonus episode when that was supposed to be this weekend and we didn't upload our idw teenage mutant ninja trolls episode it's because that video is becoming a little bit more work than we expected so we're, we're trying to figure out when we'll get that out i'm making a powerpoint i'm so, so excited it will either be this weekend or next weekend. I'm about halfway done with it now. So hopefully we'll get yes, that through. The, we, are, we, are. we have a little bit of a recording uh, like tightness this week because Katie is attending. C2E2. Uh, that's right. Uh, it's too late now. If Oh, wait, no, it's not too late now. Right. Yes, it's In not too late Wednesday. now. C2E2 yeah. is yeah. this yeah. weekend. Uh, and I will be yes. there. Uh, if you are there, you should... <laughs> Tell me, and we can we can we can hang out. I always want more. But it's great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But in terms of things that are certain, like I said, this will be either this weekend or the weekend after that, because the weekend after that, which is the second weekend of next month, is as always blocked off for the Strange Saturday Super Show. So we don't know what we're reading yet for that. Um, It's Katie's pick, so she'll decide something. Uh, but that video will be happening and that will be up. We, we don't typically have any issues recording a strange Saturday super show. So no, yeah. no, no. Uh, but as always uh, with all our weirdness, we will always have the steady presence of our Wednesday episodes. Katie. That's right. Can you tell us the polls for next Wednesday? I sure can. Next week, we will be pulling green arrow. Number 11, the six fingers. Number three, ultimate Spider-Man. Number four, and drawing blood, number one. Again, very appropriate. The, the book that really just led slotted to the last, last Ronin in at the perfect time. Yeah. Um, ben Bishop and Kevin Eastman, obviously, on that book. It was a Kickstarter book. Um, so I've read it. It's fucking awesome. But it is coming out through Image Comics um, starting next week. So that will be yeah. very, very cool. Super excited to check it out as I dive shell first into my turtles phase. Uh, 
<laughs> but because of C2E2, uh, we're not doing a back issue review this week. No, uh, no. Yeah, so hopefully uh, we will have a larger creator corner next week. Yeah. Uh, the first week in a while that we don't have an interview going on. Uh, but yep. I think we're going to just talk all things conventions. We'll yeah. see if uh, anything Absolutely. thrilling uh, leads up to C2E2 <laughs> for us. Hopefully, yeah. And um, yeah, we're going to be kind of experimenting with some back issue stuff, I think, over the next few weeks as we decide exactly yes. what we want to do with the back issue review. Um, Katie threw out the idea of doing uh, a live form back issue review. So let us know if you would be interested in tuning in and kind of getting to discuss with us, throw in comments, you know, that kind of yeah. stuff. Uh, yeah. So let and us of know course, the VODs for that would be uh, up right after yeah. uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, Absolutely. For everyone to check out. So yeah, lots of weird well, things in the pipeline yeah, the coming weeks for yeah, the script yeah. heroes here. But oh, you but know what? I'm, I'm going to throw something in here that's... Oh, okay. Oh. I, I was going to throw in here no, throw it a little in. bit. We'll, we'll get a little bit weird. We'll get a little bit, you know, sappy here. But I just wanted to say to anybody who's listening, still at this point, if you made it to the end of an episode this far, thank you guys for the, yeah. the actual awesomeness that, is, that has kind of come in the last couple of weeks in terms of people watching, engaging with, and seemingly enjoying all of our videos. It's it's really great to see. And it's been very, very nice. So yeah, and a huge yeah, milestone for us. Our Scout Comics video hit a thousand views, which is just like bonkers yes. to me. And it's literally still yes. climbing. Uh yeah. Which is insane. So like so again, thank you guys so much for supporting, for sharing, yes. uh, for tuning in. And we're at ninety subscribers now, so you know, if you want to help us. On YouTube, by the way, if you're listening to this yeah. somewhere else, whatever. On YouTube, we're at 90 subscribers, so if you want us to get to three digits, you know, click click that subscribe button. Help us get to 100. I don't think we're doing anything for 100, but help us get to 100 because it's a nice round number <laughs> and it'll make us feel good. But, there you go. as always, we'll see you next week. Come. Geeks. Am I doing this one? I am doing this one, aren't I? Sorry. That 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 that's on me. My bad. My bad. Lotus Land. Oh. Sorry, right. I also missed uh, I dropped it when I raised it up. It's just <laughs> failure all around.